welcome. Um, very grateful to have you both here and also happy to be able to moderate this. And um, this is particularly interesting in my view because both of you gentlemen are, I think it's not an uh, exaggeration to say, among the best qualified to actually um, uh, participate in such kind of debate. So that's why I'm really excited that we're having it. I'm going to just briefly introduce the two of you for, for people who don't know you. So taking the CV of both of your home pages, starting with uh, Roy, Roy Sebag. He's a director, chief executive officer from Gold Money, um, which is the world's largest precious metal saving payments and custody platform overseeing nearly $2 billion of precious metal savings for over 1.5 million clients worldwide. Mr. Zibak is also the founder and chief executive officer of Mini, a direct to customer jewelry brand which crafts pure 24 karat gold and platinum jewelry that is uh, transparently sold by gram weight. Previously, Mr. Zibak founded Bitgold, which launched in 2014 and rapidly became the most successful digital gold payments and savings platform in history. Bitgold ultimately merged with Gold Money in 2015, resulting in the creation of Gold Money Incorporate. Prior to Bitgold, Mr. Zibak was portfolio manager that engaged in a fundamental long and short equity investing in distressed event-driven and natural resource-related opportunities. Um, very impressive CV, Roy. Um, also, very impressive CV of his opponent, who is Dr. Saifedim Amus. Saifedim Amus is an economist and uh, author focusing on Bitcoin, who authored the first academic book on the economics of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Standard, the Decentralized Alternative to Central Banking, published by Wiley in 2018. Um, and Apart from being author, he also offers, off, offers um, an academy. So um, this is, I think, also something very uh, interesting. So um, I just, bit, bit, Bitcoin is a highly volatile and risky asset whose future is uncertain and whose ownership that's requires not my an, bio. that's not my bio that's so not me, your bio what, 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 what is just getting at it sorry the, yeah let's let's uh, jump just, into the yeah into the discussion please uh, saif uh, tell me tell me a little bit more about you and uh, add to the bio of yours yeah so i i've written a book on bitcoin and i'm also now uh, independently teaching economics online so i left my university job and i teach austrian economics and bitcoin economics online on my course on my website mm -hmm. safety.com uh, you can join uh, courses uh, download the lectures and watch them and join live discussions and um, yeah i'm working on an economics textbook to be completed next year as well as my next book the fiat standard beautiful okay that's great. Uh, Roy, do you have anything to add from, from your side? No, that was a long, long explanation. Uh, so that's great. And um, I, I guess I just want to say that, you know, when you asked me to join the conversation um, and you called it a, a gold versus Bitcoin debate, I think the first thing I said to you was, well, if it's going to be with Saif Dean, um, I think it might not necessarily be a debate because everything that I've seen uh, or remember from Safe Dean is generally in alignment with me. Um, and so it's probably going to be more of a, a meaningful conversation. Um, but in any event, uh, because I've, I've had a few issues in the, with the Bitcoin community, um, I just want to say out from the start that no matter which way the conversation goes, you know, my position today is, is to respond to uh, any claims that are made uh, with regards to gold. So if I'm, if I'm responding and I'm uh, giving my arguments against Bitcoin, they're they're within that context. Um, and overall, as I've continually said, I'm I am very sympathetic to the Bitcoin project. Um, you know, I sit here today as an owner of Bitcoin, and uh, we own Bitcoin in 
two companies where I, I sit on, on the board and uh, I'm a shareholder. Okay, that's great. Uh, just to to have a very uh, short context, what I do in within this uh, debate, I mean, my background is I'm coming from the gold side, but I'm very um, enthusiastically also endorsing Bitcoin. So I think I'm I'm pretty neutral. Um, we at Increment to invest in both, so we have a fund which invests in gold and Bitcoin. So, so that's uh, basically, in a nutshell, how I fit into this debate, and uh, I want to keep it pretty open as well. So, I think that's that's a good idea. Um, I just would like to perhaps uh, go through a few topics along the, this discussion or debate, um, and if I may, I would like to start with with one point since it's so relevant today, uh, just kind of to 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 get it out of the room because I know a lot of people. Um, when it comes to gold versus Bitcoin, obviously talk about uh, supply, uh, talk about stock to flow. And why don't we just start comparing these two um, assets um, from, from the quantitative perspective, stock to flow. Um, and as Roy basically, I'd say, is, is, is the guest, since this is a, a Bitcoin conference, uh, I'd, I'd like to... Uh, start with, with his thoughts when it comes to stock to flow, gold versus Bitcoin. Um, how, how do you compare these two, two, these two uh, things? Yeah, so I think that's going to be an issue for me because I, I reject the comparison. I, I think it's a flawed comparison from the start. I think that Bitcoin um, represents faith in the reality of mathematics and a flawed understanding that this uh, man-made language is unchanging. Gold requires no such faith. Um, it exists as part of, of nature. Uh, we have no choice in believing the reality of nature. It just is, gold just is. And so when you get into this um, uh, idea of, 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 of comparing something that's abstract, uh, existing with abstract quantities, with something that's physical, uh, rooted in, in, in the actual natural world that can be uh, weighed and measured, um, I reject the comparison. So I think that uh, that's, that's one of my, my core issues. And I don't think it's an issue that, that needs to hurt Bitcoin in the long term. I just think it's a, it's a mistake to, to talk about Bitcoin and gold in that way. I'd, I'd say that um, it's um, ultimately the fact that Bitcoin has been around for 10, 12 years now and the supply growth rate has stuck to the um, original schedule um, and that with every passing day, it gets harder and harder to imagine how this could possibly change because if it couldn't cha be changed in 2010, 12, 15, it's much harder to change it in 2020 when the network is much bigger and people are already invested in it. So. Um, obviously, Bitcoin has nowhere near the long track record of gold of, you know, thousands of years of being there and being reliable and um, proving itself. But that advantage is declining with every single day in which Bitcoin survives and Bitcoin continues to operate that I think it's um, it's it, 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 it's we can very confidently assume that the supply growth rate is good for Bitcoin is going to continue according to schedule. And I think uh, that's ultimately what makes gold money. And that's why gold matters as money. And I think the difference between something being physical or being abstract um, or, or non-physical is completely immaterial here because they both can perform the function of being used as a medium of exchange. So I could give you a gold coin or I could give you, I could send you Bitcoin on the Bitcoin network and you would accept it. And we've seen Bitcoin operate for 10 years um, as, as this medium of exchange, people can, tr um, can exchange it and can know that it is part of the supply and know that there won't be any inflation beyond it. So the guarantees of mathematics have proven uh, strong enough that uh, it's, I mean, obviously there's nothing certain in life. So it is an entrepreneurial decision for somebody to decide whether they want to hold gold or not. But with every passing day, it just becomes more and more clear that the physicality is not an object. The scarcity is guaranteed. Uh, the physicality is not a problem and the scarcity is guaranteed of, of the supply. 
And I think that then brings us to the issue of the supply growth rate, which in Bitcoin, you know, in the next hour or so is going to decline to being around the same level as uh, gold's uh, supply growth rate. And then it'll continue to decline further and further. So as it stands, the gold supply increases every year at around 1.5%. And that's, as I explained in my book, that is why gold is money. It's not because it's yellow. It's not because it's shiny. It's not because of anything else. It's because it's the one thing whose supply can reliably grow at the lowest rate every year. And so I think we're going to be seeing this getting challenged by Bitcoin right now. And I think um, it's, it's, it's very important because um, if you think about it in the long run, you know, in 50 years from now or in 20, 30 years from now, the gold supply is going to be doubling or 50 years or so it'll take for the gold supply to double, whereas Bitcoin supply is never going to double. So when you think about it as a long term store of value, Bitcoin has the edge here. But of course, the bigger edge that Bitcoin has is that it is usable internationally, whereas gold, unfortunately, is not because of government restrictions. And that's probably the next thing that we should talk about. But yeah, Nanak. Yeah, that's so, a good segue. So, but yeah, I, I mean, go ahead. I, I reject ahead. most of what you said. I think you're you're conflating a lot of concepts and a lot of topics. But let's just start with uh, you use the word medium of exchange to define um, Bitcoin. So I just want to understand: Are you differentiating there between the word money and medium of exchange, or do you recognize you're not? So you money is the general exchange. General medium of exchange. Sorry. Money is the general medium of exchange. Okay, but so you're not, so you didn't say money though, you said medium of exchange, which which I would agree with. But the other word that you used was it's immaterial. And I think that's a very important word that is gonna keep coming up if we're gonna try to make these comparisons. So when you talk about uh, the stock and the supply of Bitcoin, um, implicit in everything you're saying, even though you're not mentioning it, is a tremendous amount of faith in so many aspects of the fundamental architecture of Bitcoin. You have faith in a specific elliptic curve, SECP 256K1, a curve that was invented by BlackBerry. You have specific faith in the discrete logarithm problem being something that is under mathematical theory today, just hard. You have uh, distinct faith in modulus arithmetic. You have distinct faith in the prime number theorem. You have so much faith in something that you have the that yet you have the confidence to assert that it just so happens that you were born at this time, at this era, and based on something that's been around for ten years, which I don't think would be enough to even have a regression, um, claim that we can estimate into the future that the supply of this unit, which can only be measured by itself, which is abstract, is somehow comparable to gold. And then you claimed that the certainty for why gold is money uh, was because of its supply. And I would argue that the certainty for why gold is money is because it belongs to the same certainty of the natural world with which we engage, perceive, and act. And it is under that standard, the standard of reality, that gold exists as an immutable element part of an irreducible building block of elements that make up all the tangible objects that are ready to hand. And then lastly, I disagree with how you even portray the supply of gold because first of all, you begin with uh, an assumption that you know what the stock of gold is. And then based on that knowledge of the stock, and most of the people that are using this gold stock are relying on uh, one of my good friends analysis, James Turk's analysis, uh, for the gold stock from 15 years ago, um, there is no way to know how many grains of sand there are. There is no way to know how much gold exists. We can know how much gold is produced by publicly traded corporations uh, and some private entities. I used to uh, put together a report called the natural uh, annual ranking of gold mines and deposits, and I tried to do just that. But nowhere in even the projections of investment banks that cover these companies is anyone forecasting a doubling of the annual mine supply of gold? So even there, I just have to disagree with you um, because if anything, what we're seeing is declining head grades in mining and we're seeing mining companies shift from focusing on uh, producing ounces to producing uh, return on equity free cash flow like Barrick and Newmont companies like that. So I don't necessarily see that the gold supply is gonna double, but more importantly, 
I absolutely have no faith uh, to predict that in 10 or 20 or 30 years, the Bitcoin uh, elliptic curve won't have to be replaced. And in that case, you'll have to fork it again or merge it. And I don't have faith that uh, the supply is purely limited to what the algorithm states right now based on a world of mathematics. Okay, so first of all, um, when it comes to discussing these things in terms of faith, I think the, um, you know, we, we all, we all, we have, if you want to call it faith, you know, we have faith in so many sophisticated technology all over the world, not collapsing and not falling and not destroying life everywhere. So if, if encryption and these curves and this, these problems of mathematics break down, we have far bigger problems than just uh, Bitcoin breaking down. We, not necessarily, because you have a, you have no necessarily because then you know internet traffic and uh, credit cards and finance and nuclear launch codes, all of that stuff stops functioning if mathematics stops to function. So um, not necessarily, because the, those are closed systems. You're dealing with an open system. So no, a nuclear bomb going off is not a closed system. It could uh, destroy no, but a closed system doesn't, doesn't require anyone to figure out a point on a curve. Uh, these are closed systems with air gaps, and that's why. That's fine. But anyways, I let you finish, so I appreciate right, sure. your response. So the point is that, uh, you know, we're already taking far larger faith in uh, math in all other aspects of things. And then the other thing is that this is being won day by day, and nobody's saying that you know Bitcoin is going to take over the world today. But with every day that it continues to survive, and that people continue to try and attack it, and continue to find fault lines in it, and then still they fail. It continues to prove that okay, maybe this is something that is reliable, that is as real as physical things. And you say that gold is money because of its uh, it's part of reality and part of the material world. Well, a lot of other things are part of the material world, and they are not money. Why isn't copper or nickel or zinc money? Why isn't silver money or uh, or, co or, or or nickel or <laughs> iron? So iron, good. copper, and silver were money, and they've gotten demonetized. So just the fact that something is material doesn't mean that it makes uh, mo good money. And it only became money. You know, why was it silver and gold that were the last two mo physical monies? Because they're the ones that have the lowest supply growth rate. We cannot be sure of gold's exact supply growth rate. But as you said, we have pretty good data on annual production over the past few years. And if you look at the last few decades and you look at annual production, you know, that pretty much is the majority of the supply because uh, 100 years ago, the, 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 the entire supply that was around has increased dramatically over the 100 years because with all of the annual production. So even if there are errors in estimating how much gold there is in Indian uh, temples, and some people say there's much more gold there than we imagine, that might well be the case. And it might be the case that the gold stock to flow might be even lower than we suspect it is, but it can't be much lower and it can't be much higher than uh, around the 1% range just because we have pretty reliable data on the production over the last 50 years, and that constitutes the majority of the supply. So annual production every year is going to continue to be a small amount. And I, I don't think you dispute the fact that the gold supply does not increase at large percentages every uh, year. It increases at small percentages, but it does increase, and these percentage increases add up. And so over 50 years, we know that there will be more gold produced every year. We're going to just keep digging deeper holes finding better um, ways of finding uh, gold, and we're going to get more gold, but we're only ever going to get about another 3 million uh, Bitcoins, and that's it. That's all the Bitcoin that, that, that is ever uh, going to be there because, uh, I mean, your argument seems to suggest that if you're saying that the uh, supply of gold is larger, then are you saying that gold production is going to be increasing at a higher rate, so are we going to be getting faster supply growth of gold? In any case, this isn't, I think the difference in the stock to flow might be uh, important in the long run, but I think the real and most important difference between gold and Bitcoin and why I think um, it's uh, it, it, it is just the ability to get around government restrictions. And it's something that, um, to be honest, you know, with this current crisis and what we're seeing happen over the last year or so, it's something that's driving me more and more toward considering the idea that, yeah, gold is becoming demonetized like silver because you know, currencies all over the world are imploding. People are having so many problems with their money. And what are the alternatives that they're seeking? They're seeking the dollar or they're seeking Bitcoin. And that's basically it because you can't sell the gold internationally because governments won't let you send gold internationally. And so this is the period in which you would have expected gold to shoot up. You would have expected gold payment solutions to emerge to allow people to use gold for international trade. 
and yet we find that basically gold barely moves as a price nobody can use it because you can't send it abroad and really it's it was gold's time to shine, but I think Bitcoin is going to be taking over that shine because you can send Bitcoin across borders. Yeah. So, okay. I, you basically never responded to what I uh, argued and then you threw in a bunch of new topics. So, so let me just get back to what I was saying and see if we can either agree or disagree. Cause I think that's the best way to have a meaningful conversation. So what I said about the natural world was not that something has to be material to be money. What I said clearly was that something in the natural world that exhibits natural properties is how we even have the notion of certainty. We wouldn't have the scientific method if we didn't have irreducible, unchanging corporeal elements that we can observe, measure, test, and predict. In fact, we wouldn't even have language or a logos if we didn't have something that we could point to to compare to something else. So my issue is that I don't see Bitcoin as belonging to the realm of corporeality. I see it belonging to the realm of mathematics. And with regards, to, so, so I reject the comparison. And then I also reject your attempt to analyze gold supply uh, based on the numbers that you're just using uh, and, and to try to quantify those numbers as somehow relating in any way, shape or form to Bitcoin. Um, and then, the other issue here is that when you think about gold and gold supply, the, the reason um, that the gold supply is different from the silver supply or different from the copper supply, it, it has nothing to do with the act of mining. It has to do with those natural attributes again. So specific gravity, uh, conductivity, electronegativity, malleability, ductility, crustal abundance. These are entirely different elements with different features. That's why the head grade on a silver mine you know, I own a silver mine that has 30 grams per ton head grade, but a good gold mine, as Mark will tell you, is half a gram or one gram per ton. So there are these physical limits that restrict how much gold you can produce per physical space relative to how much silver you can produce per physical space, which then coupled with the other natural attributes uh, uh, provide for the diminishing utility of every element, how much it costs to move it, how much it costs to transport it. But fundamentally, I think they're, they're two different things. And it, like I said, I think it's a flawed comparison because you know, what I generally see is, I see this predilection to invoke the Austrian tradition, the tradition of Austrian economics, and then the natural features of gold, which you just did. But in the process, you're just advocating for like a supersessionary movement that subsumes the tradition of Austrian economics, subsumes the immutability, predictability, the neutrality of gold, and then you just inject your own human ideas and somehow mix them all together. And so I see very clear leaps in logic um, with something even very basic, like the definition of a Mengarian saleable good uh, or the notion of regressions. So you've taken the concepts predicated on neutrality and objectivity, and, uh, and then you take a great liberty by maintaining the theory, but, but adding uh, an abstract service, which you keep calling a digital good, um, with, based on the human language of mathematics. Okay, well, that's a lot, but I think uh, the, the important thing, the important disagreement is that you say that it's the physical properties of gold that are what make it money. But I think there's an important distinction here. The physical properties of gold are what give it the low supply growth rate or the high stock to flow ratio. That's what makes it money. Okay, so it's what's not the ultimate causality? Yeah, I'm but sorry? What, what comes first in the law of causality? It's yes, but Bitcoin finds another way of establishing that stock to flow no, ratio. A bunch of human and, 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 and I totally understand that it's it's totally acceptable that you, for you to not find this to be convincing and for you to not join Bitcoin. And you know, it's it, it, it's 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 an entrepreneurial call, just like your entrepreneurial call to use Bitcoin Cash and tell it and tell us that this was the future of digital currency a few years ago. We right. still have all those tweets where yeah. you talk about how Bitcoin Cash that, is the future. So I mean, this is this, this 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 is just entrepreneurial decisions. You can that's think that Bitcoin Cash will be better than Bitcoin. You can think that Bitcoin will never be able to make it because of math not being reliable. And that's the, you know, the market will reward or punish that statement. So it's not something that I can argue with um, because it's, it's, it's about your belief. However, I think the key point to keep in mind is that 
it isn't the physicality of gold that matters to make it into money. We can have a digital good that we could use as money as long as people can see it show up on their node and they can know that it is um, reliable. They know that the system isn't being hacked. If you're able to establish the high stock to flow on something that is not physical, then you've gotten the properties that you need for money. That's, that's really the key point. And so continuing to obsess over the physicality of it, over the physical properties, misses the point. And this is, and, you know, we get into the realm of mystic thought and the alchemists have been obsessed well, with The alchemists are the ones that are the mathematicians, actually. That's the exact problem. I mean, you yourself, before we started, are concerned about certain technologies. Why is that? Why don't you trust epidemiology? Why don't you trust these predictions that are made in math? Why does Menger fundamentally re reject the use of mathematical methods and insists that the soul of economics is to investigate essences, phenomena, not specific quantities, but your entire comparison of S2F, which you guys got again from the gold, gold industry, is trying to compare something. I just think there's a much more powerful way to argue for Bitcoin. And I don't need to get into the. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've, see, I've seen your arguments for Bitcoin Cash. I would disagree. But, but, but you I think, think that's a serious. I mean, you really think that saying something like that is a serious way to engage in a conversation that, out of thousands of tweets, taking some tweets out of context or tongue in cheek, that dictates everything about me? About how it I was it, it wasn't involved with this. It was, it was a years. long period in which you were very convinced that Bitcoin Cash was the future. What, what long period? What, okay, uh, okay, 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 gentlemen, yeah. I'm I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna step in here. I'm gonna step in here. We've got a heated debate. I mean, I mean, yesterday I was on Twitter and I saw Charlie Magara, who's uh, was head of Goldman Sachs Metals Trading, and now works for blockchain, uh, uh, one of the big blockchain companies, and he said, you know, I went to dinner with some Wall Street uh, people that was trying to sell Bitcoin. And at the end of the dinner, I tried to uh, send them some Bitcoins and it, it, it took too long. So I ended up sending them Bitcoin cash. You know, some, sometimes I wonder, and you know, the maximalists came in and destroyed him. And, but, but the point is people are allowed to criticize a technology. If something is a technology, it's a service. And this is this is my bigger issue. I'm trying to understand. No, no, nobody is uh, disputing your right to criticizing yeah. it. I'm just saying that maybe perhaps you might want to consider that your understanding of this problem of this topic is a little bit problematic when you think that as an obvious scam like Bitcoin Cash is even comparable it, to Bitcoin. It, it didn't seem like an obvious scam at the time, and you can't it make it like an obvious scam for people who understood Bitcoin. No, no that, that's that's not true. The only thing that you guys uh, have done is you've stuck to one thing thick or thin hodl which is a very commendable thing that's what people with a joint belief do and that may very well be a strength but i i just want to try to understand something Wh where do you get the idea that money can be a digital good or a service uh through austrian economics i i i've really tried to understand that point money is subjective the key concept in austrian economics is you know that there's no religious um uh, dictates that gold has to be money. In fact, you see that the Austrian economists are constantly talking about how gold, how money is subjective, and the choice of what makes money is the, the is the function of the market, and that the free market is about uh, the, the, and that the correct, you know, the correct Austrian prescription for this is not that we need the government to install a gold standard. We need the government to let the free market emerge, and then from the free market, you would get gold as money or gold and silver and you know the, the, the there there are clear uh, the, there's a clear um, so uh, so Menger doesn't discuss anything about a good needing no he work. does he talks and he explains and why characters gold of a good saleable good okay. and it is about the saleability and we see that ultimately the function of the saleability can be best attained by something that has a low supply growth rate but ultimately what really matters is it, uh, more important than anything that Menger said, what matters is that Bitcoin is being used as money and it has been used as money for 10 years. So people use it as money, whether you like it or not. And if it continues to work and they continue to work it, they continue to use it and the value continues to go up and more and more people join, your theoretical problems with mathematics or with the physicality or the lack of physicality become really just uh, the, the, the problems that delay your ability to adopt Bitcoin, but not a problem for Bitcoin. So, so this goes into the whole reason that you need to have this, this pitch. But I went back to Menger um, and I went back to the principles of economics and I read the term that he uses for goods. And he uses a term, Nutzlichkeiten, or usefulness in German, 
within the great universal structure of relationships, subject to the law of causality. So what he's actually referring to here is the, is the notion of goods, the concept of goods advanced by Aristotle in the politics. So, he's, so, the, so the word here in Greek is chrema, things, goods, property, tools, a thing, physical, that one uses or needs. Sophocles uses the term to refer to Apollo's cattle as a thing to be desired. So it can be an inanimate good or an animate good, but nowhere is it mentioned that the good can be a service or a labor service. There was no digital world back then. The concept of there being something digital was just not present, and uh, that changed. And you know, also, you know, Menger and Mises and those people aren't divine. This isn't a religion. They have been wrong about things, and they will continue okay. to be wrong. And the world will find things that are wrong about them. But um, in, in this case, they're not even wrong. They cannot have possibly imagined the category of a digital good before the digital. Uh, world had been even invented and that doesn't mean we throw away everything that they wrote because they didn't write about the digital era but also you can't tell the, all the billions of dollars worth of bitcoin all the people that are trading billions of dollars worth of bitcoin for actual goods and services every day you cannot tell those people that no no no, this thing isn't money it's not but a that's exactly what we do with fiat i mean the austrians specifically singled out fiat and their entire project was an annihilation of fiat so my argument, at least if you agree, but fiat me, doesn't emerge on the market. Fiat needs a gun in order to make it work. Yeah. And so the Austrian argument is that you should stop putting guns to people's head and let the market decide what money is. And Bitcoin is an example of that. It emerges on the market. Yeah. So if you agree with me that Bitcoin can't be a good and it's a service, I think that's very. I don't agree. You don't, don't agree. agree. So you still think it could be a good, even though the definition of a good was always a physical, useful tool, something in it of itself. Because the problem here is, if, if you think Bitcoin um, can exist as a good that's just money, then the real issue is, when Menger is referring to Aristotle's politics and the law of causation, what he's specifically referring to is where Aristotle argues that as it relates to money, we should always treat the physical objects in ways that are benefiting of their final nature. And since the concept of money is not meant to be a good in itself, it is unnatural to desire money as an end in itself. So this is, of course, that fetishism of Marx, the MCM. But the issue here is you can't have something which doesn't exist, that has no actual usefulness, which is then desired just as, as something in itself as the concept of money, devoid, devoid, divorced from the actual good. Why not? We, this because is that's what we have. what the Austrians say. That was their entire argument. So you're invoking their tradition. I have no, no but. Problem. The thing is, the, the, this the, this tradition is essentially to, to 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 counter the claim that government was needed for money. This was not to counter the claim that a digital good could be money. So this is being applied out of context. You have the state theory of money that was saying, all right, money has to be whatever the government says it is, and if a government puts the king's head on a coin, then that coin becomes money. So according to the state theory of money, a golden coin is money because it has the uh, head of the king on it, not because it is made out of gold. The, Keynes, uh, the Austrian answer is that no, gold is money and the king has to put his head on gold in order for his coins to be money because if he put it on something else, then the market will never accept it as money or you know, he'd have to use force in order to try and make it. But natural money that emerges on the market can emerge on its own. So in other words, the Austrian argument is, that, is, is to try and show people that actually money can emerge and that's the point from the regression argument. It's not to say that, it, it, and, and when they say that money emerges from a market good, the point is that it doesn't emerge from the barrel of a gun. Not that it somehow, you know, Mises or Menger were writing 100 years ago and could foresee a digital good and were um, d dismissing the prospect that you could have a digital good or that you could have a purely monetary good. Um, it was never imaginable before uh, that we could have a purely monetary good, but here we are. Although, to be fair, Bitcoin is not entirely free monet uh, an entirely monetary good because it's also needed to pay the transaction costs on the Bitcoin network. So it's the only uh, thing that you can use in order to um, pay the Bitcoin network. Okay, so again, I, I just have a problem with, with how you're describing this because Menger goes on in his own book to specifically single out and distinguish between things and a special category of goods such as per personal services and rights. So the point here, and, and then von Mises goes even further and says that all the goods are ordered with the, ult the first order goods being of ultimate value and all other things of val are valued according to the part they play in the production of those goods. 
So how can you have a, uh, a digital good, which I am calling a service because I think that's exactly how the Austrians would have defined it. And I have no problem. I think you could still argue for Bitcoin as a service. Um, but how can a service or a good that clearly isn't of the first order ever be useful enough to be money? It would impact the pricing and the economic calculations of every household. Why would a household ever desire that the same way that it desires the fundamental goods that it needs in order to cooperate and achieve prosperity? Because money is a good on its own. Being able to hold a cash balance is a service uh, that is valuable, that is useful, that has a utility to people. No, in other words, not more than no, 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 more than no, no. You use the money in order to be able to exchange it. The fact that you need to go and use the money means that the money has value to you. That's, that's, not, that's not how balance. the Austrians. That's not how the Austrians defined it. That's neither that how Aristotle how defined it. Austrians discuss cash balances. Talk. See the discussion of cash balance. Yeah, Why but, but there's a, there's a, there's a distinction. Why for cash balance? It's because of uncertainty. Life is uncertain, and that means that you cannot structure all of your payments and all of your receipts. So that the, that they that you never that you never have to hold cash. I mean, optimally, if you could do this, you'd rather have the, all of your money invested at all times and to only liquidate it immediately when you want to spend it, and you wouldn't want to hold any cash because cash doesn't earn returns. And yet, everybody has a cash balance. Why? Because there's value in it, and because of the use of money as a medium of exchange has value in it. So this is a valuable thing on its own, and just the fact that um, gold. Um, had a market use other than money doesn't mean that money on its own is not a good. That's, I think, a very important point. It's not but, gold, it's any good. But but again, what you're doing here is you're, you're taking various analyses in the tradition of Austrian school, like a Rothbard an analysis of, of cash balances or of on Mises, and, you, and you've divorced the original conception of money having to be a good that's useful and having being economically ordered, where there's an economic order. So, so the problem is that um, uh, in, in doing so, you're basically, again, conflating uh, the various concepts because I can meditate on what money is or I can have a reflection on what money is as money, money qua money, but that doesn't mean that I've changed the definition that the money has to be a good. So we can agree to disagree, but, the, but, but what I was hoping, I was really hoping to hear if you, if you could see that at least Bitcoin is a service and it could be a valuable service because that's how von Mises described immaterial things. And by the way, I don't, I don't accept that other argument too. I don't think that the Austrians were too stupid to predict that something like a fiat money issued by private people, which is what Bitcoin is, it's not some magic mystical technology. It's people working together in a decentralized way, just like everyone is today under COVID uh, and, and building something. But then Bitcoin has this aspect to it where once the thing was built, everyone revels in it like, oh, my God, look, it's working the way we hoped it was going to work. And then they go on to start convincing everyone about how good it is. But it can never replace that Austrian understanding of the thing having to be a good, which basically separates it from a service in a very important way, making it completely, truly decentralized in the real world. And then that usefulness of the good allowing it to become a money. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, Mises is pretty clear about the fact that um, he discusses the fact that gold and silver are affected by their monetary uses and by the in variations in, in their industrial demand. And he says that this is actually makes, this is not ideal, but he says they're better money than government money because these forces of industrial demand and variations in mining supply, these forces are far more, uh, are far less um, uh, influential on their role as money than the forces of government intervention into money. In other words, the ability, if, if, if Mises had ever seen a purely monetary good, he would have thought it would be even superior as money you to gold. You can't say that though. You can't just no, speak you can. I didn't say it. Mises says it. I'll, I'll share the quote. Uh, I'll, I'll dig it up and I'll share it. And I think somebody from the chat must know it because I share it all the time on Twitter. But anyways, I think um, putting the philosophical aside, discussion aside, we can we can we can argue about what is right and what is wrong but at the end of the day people all over the world have to make decisions and they need to make their decisions based on what they think is um based on what they think is the most a beneficial thing for them and people are going to start taking these choices and these decisions in their life based on what works for them and what they see around them and the reality is i think really the, the thing that roy needs to come to terms with is 
You look at gold today, where the world is falling apart, and central banks all over the world are in crisis, um, currencies are getting debauched and destroyed in many, many countries, liquidity crisis in all countries, and instead people are running to the US dollar, which is the root of the problem. People are going back to the to, to, to the root of the problem because it's it's and, 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 and that's really the problem, you know. It's 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 not possible for something like bit gold to function like bitcoin it's 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 always centralized it has a single point of failure and therefore it's never going to be possible for you to be able to trade money internationally and allow uh, and use this and that's why you know we see that as this uh, catastrophe is happening we don't see gold taking over it's just yet another crisis that happens in which gold bugs come in with high hopes that yet this is the time everything is going to collapse and gold is going to be the money and here we are, we see it again, it's not happening for gold and people are sticking to the dollar and the only alternative that can actually work is Bitcoin. Plus, I think the other thing to keep in mind is gold has a market capital capitalization of about $8 trillion. So the potential for it to rise is very, very slow, very small. In other words, if you wanted to double the price of Bitcoin, uh, the price of gold, you need $8 trillion more of holders to be holding more uh, uh, gold, which is a lot of money. On the other hand, Bitcoin needs another $200 billion worth of holders in order for it to double in price. So the upside potential is much, 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 much larger in Bitcoin. So you add to that the fact that it can be sent across borders and you know, most people unfortunately don't have the ability to have all of these very sophisticated intellectual philosophical discussions about what Menger actually meant and um, the material reality and all that stuff and whether math is real or math is not real. Most people are going to s learn from uh, looking around them that people who are using Bitcoin are doing much better and they're being able to av avert the damages from the crisis. And that's going to uh, influence more and more people. And that, that's ultimately what it's uh, going to be driving it. You know, the, the, the number go up technology, which um, uh, Bitcoiners, uh, which Bitcoiners says, you know, the actual underlying technology behind Bitcoin is going to continue to attract more and more people uh, to Bitcoin. It's, it, it's what gold bugs have been dreaming about since the 1970s, which is, you know, a continuation of the 1970s when the dollar what fell from $30 an ounce to 800 an ounce that we would have just continued this but it hasn't continued but bitcoin has an opportunity to do it because it's small it has massive scope for appreciation and it has wings it can run it can cross international borders so i'm glad that we... sorry sorry i want to i want to i want to i want to step in here because this is a very lively discussion an open discussion this is great um, we've been talking, just to recapitulate uh, so far what we've been talking, we've been talking about uh, stock to flow ratio, and then we've been talking about all sort of different topics, mainly academic topics. I think in both these areas, uh, you have to agree to disagree as far as I could take away. I would like to go a little bit into more a practical, uh, uh, to practical points, which, which often have been discussed. For instance, um, would start uh, like to start um, some points of criticism which are often brought against gold from the Bitcoin side, which is um, verification, divisibility, and storage. So, um, Roy, uh, w w how could you perhaps make an argument that that the verification is not a big problem or not a problem at all when using gold. Divisibility is not a problem and, and storage can also be solved. Yeah, so and then I've got a few others. I, for, I appreciate for that, Mark, but I, I do need to respond to uh, what Saifin <laughs> said earlier. So I agree that we, uh, we, 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 we agree to disagree on everything we discussed thus far, and I'm happy to advance to some of the other points that um, Saifin okay. is making. So Saifin um, continues to make these comparisons. Now, what Saifdeen's ultimately doing now after, after establishing this weak foundation is he's essentially making the following argument, that a hyperinflation is an opportunity for profit. So owning money doesn't make you rich, it merely preserves your purchasing power. The whole Bitcoin narrative now has essentially become a macro hedge fund thesis on how to profit from the coming hyperinflation. This is not how the real economy works. That's why I was stressing the real physical corporeal economy versus the illusory economy. A hyperinflation will hyperinflate real goods and real industries. 
but illusory services will just as easily, easily be deleted. These kinds of industries, which power most of our global economy today, were illusory to begin with and existed only because of fiat monetary debasement. If anything, advocating for Bitcoin to rise in a hyperinflation uh, only results in the supporting of the service economy, which is inflated. It reduces localism. It increases centralized dependence on the Internet and the states which control it. Gold does not care, Saifedean, if you think that it hasn't risen enough in lieu of the money printing. To the person owning it, it has preserved purchasing power effortlessly on any human savings cycle. And it's at an all-time high in every currency except for USD. So in a hyperinflation, entire industries will get destroyed and gold will continue to maintain its purchasing power relative to the real human cooperation, which never changes, the things that do not change. Gold is not supposed to appreciate uh, and inflate nominally against a bubble economy or illusory values. Doing so would support that immeasurable economy. The gold, that gold is currently at a $10 trillion stock, while global financial assets are at a $300 trillion stock, doesn't make me say, well, why isn't gold higher? It makes me realize that the $300 trillion global financial assets are likely going to drop in real terms. And so with Bitcoin, you're looking to profit on this hyperinflation, which is just such an illogical proposition because you're betting that Bitcoin will rise in a hyperinflation relative to everything else, even an improved bit version of Bitcoin in 50 years. So I see this ideology of blind faith in the evolutionism of Bitcoin. Uh, and then you contextualize everything is changing for the better all the time. And, and I think that's going to end up being a double edged sword because a hyperinflation will destroy so many industries that you have no uh, no sure way of saying that Bitcoin will survive a hyperinflation or somehow benefit better than gold. No, I, I have to be clear. I, I did not mean that it would be hyperinflation that is necessary for Bitcoin. In fact, in one of my recent papers, I argue that I think uh, Bitcoin is, 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 is a way to get out of the fiat uh, catastrophe without hyperinflation because Bitcoin, and, 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 and it's not about hyperinflation at this point, it's about the fact that you have a financial crisis, it's about the fact that people are looking for a safe haven, and it's about the fact that people are looking for uh, ways to escape capital controls and to escape inflation and confiscation and bail-ins. All of those things happening worldwide are quite distinct from hyperinflation. In fact, we could be talking about a uh, strong deflationary uh, crisis over the coming years. So, the, the, the and, and the key thing that I mentioned in, in that paper is that I don't think Bitcoin needs hyperinflation because Bitcoin is the monetization of a hard asset, just like gold. However, the fiat system is the monetization of debt. And so what is happening as more and more demand for Bitcoin increases, on the one hand, you'd think, all right, well, demand for Bitcoin increases, that means demand for holding dollars declines and that in then will then lead to the collapse, collapse of the dollar. However, if demand for holding Bitcoin increase, then you would also expect that the demand for holding uh, for, for U.S. debt would decline. And so Bitcoin can solve the problem of um, fiat by simply allowing the world to monetize something better, which is a hard asset, which is Bitcoin, rather than monetizing debt. And so we can reduce the amount of debt, reduce the money supply. And effectively, we don't have to have a hyperinflationary collapse of the dollar. We can just Bitcoin can continue to grow as the in real terms as the dollar economy maintains its size or grows at a lower rate in real terms. And I think eventually we could look back at this and see it as being more like an upgrade. Um, and, and, and the difference is that gold cannot have this. Gold cannot monetize without a hyperinflationary episode because it, it, it would require an enormous amount of um, capital to go into gold and to be dropped out of fiat. And that's not, uh, you know, there isn't that much, even, even though you'd need a lot of capital to go in, there isn't a lot of appreciation potential because we are already in $8 trillion or $10 trillion market. So even if you bring in another $10 trillion, that's only 100%, which, you know, in Bitcoin terms is really not that much. So in Bitcoin, on the other hand, if you bring in $8 trillion, the price of a Bitcoin is going to go much, 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 much higher. So this is far more enticing. Plus, of course, the fact, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the difficulty of moving uh, gold around. So I'm not saying that this is a, a play to profit on hyperinflation. I'm saying uh, as the current system continues to suffer its problems, 
it's the time for gold and Bitcoin to shine. And, um, you know, you started off by saying this is going to be more of a discussion. But I think, you know, over the last year, I've revised my views a little bit more. And I'm beginning to think more and more that um, the, 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 the inability of gold to uh, deliver um, might just see it continuously get more and more demonetized. And we can see it happening just like what happened with silver, that as the thing uh, stops appreciating, which was what happened toward the end of the 19th century when everybody switched to the gold standard, um, the price of silver started depreciating in terms of gold. And so as the price of silver increased, uh, as the price of uh, gold increased and the price of silver decreased, there was less demand for silver. And that then meant that silver became cheaper in real terms and so started being used in industrial applications further and further. And when you start getting used in industrial applications, it's actually bad for the monetary role because you're taking parts of the stockpile that is already existing, which could be liquid in a market, which is there as part of the stockpile that um, formulates the entire supply, the liquidity pool. When you start taking it out of that liquid supply and you put it into uh, industrial uses, it stops being part of the money. And so it brings the stockpile down and then new production becomes larger percentage of the stockpile. In other words, putting uh, existing gold or silver in industrial uses lowers the stock to flow of gold and silver. And this is the process that's been going around with silver for the past 150 years. And as a result of it, you know, 150 years ago, the price of silver to gold, the gold to silver ratio was about 15 to one. Today, it's around 120 to one. So perhaps we're beginning to see something similar happening with gold. You know, we've seen so much inflation in the fiat world, and yet gold has been uh, at this kind of level for the past 10 years or so, um, another 10 and 20 years of, of gold not rising significantly, it's going to start getting used more and more in industrial applications, and then new production will become more significant, so the stock to flow for gold will decline further, and it becomes more and more of an industrial metal. Okay. Um, I completely reject everything you say again, so you're, you're, you're completely misunderstanding uh, something like silver. And you, once you separate the notion of the real economy from the abstract economy, uh, you're likely to make those errors because you don't understand things the way they naturally are. So the fundamental purpose of silver being a good that has usefulness is never as a store of value. It's based on its utility. So if someone is using silver, they're you know, turning it into tableware or a mirror or a solar panel and it provides them with utility. And then it also has a store of value function by virtue of the debasement of fiat money. The, this relationship between silver and gold and all other elements naturally never changes. So I understand that you uh, take uh, the ratios of silver to gold to be set in stone based on the edicts and the ratios of governments trying to essentially reverse Gresham's law, get people to use silver and accumulate their gold. But I don't, I look at the head grades of silver, I look at the crustal abundance, and what I see is silver has always been just as rare relative to gold in the past as it was today. But to a family that you know had a tableware set of silver 100 years ago that provides them with antiseptic properties when they're eating and is beautiful, and that was 65 cents an ounce, and now it's $16 an ounce. Silver has done just fine in preserving the store value for that utility function. No, that hasn't made up for the time and effort that they had to put in to keep uh, shining it and preventing it from rusting throughout the, all of that time. It doesn't. Silver doesn't rust. It tarnishes. And, and all yeah, exactly. So you, need to, you need to keep rubbing it. If they bought stainless steel, it would have looked nicer. Well, that, that's absolutely that's an absolute nonsense. In fact, this this goes back to a greater issue here, which is. When you're stuck with the paradigm of, of analyzing the illusory fiat money economy, and you miss something so important here about silver, because what you have to understand is that in the gold standard economy, the kinds of products that were produced, and I, I think I've heard you speak about this before, were of higher quality such that the good itself had a component of labor and a component of the commodity value. So a family would be able to afford a, a silverware set. Today, a, a tableware set is made out of pig iron or shitty nickel. And the family is primarily paying for the marginal service of producing that at the highest possible margin. And then we get the debt-based consumption and we get the uh, debasement of money and that keeps going further and further. So we have shittier products, lower quality products that have less utility. But in the old days, when we had a gold standard, 
you would basically be able to consume products, uh, use them, and they would have a subsequent monetary value. So I don't think you can analyze silver uh, the way you do and arrive at any conclusion. And moreover, the price of silver and all those other fiat currencies that I mentioned uh, has been doing just fine too. So I don't need, if I reject the comparison to Bitcoin, if I- Why see not price it in gold? Why don't you look at the price of silver in gold? Again, it's gone down 90%. The natural attributes, my friend. Silver- but it's lost 90% of its value. If you wanted to get a silver no, ounce, no, you no, need it. The, one the, ounce of gold could buy you 15 ounces of silver in 1870. Today, it can buy you 100 and 120. According, according, to, the, according to the official ratio, which there's one, no official ratio. To, there's always only been a market ratio, and it's changed. We've had this discussion on Twitter, and you continue to be in denial about it. But the yeah, silver no, 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 to gold no, no, ratio no, let me, let is me, a well known thing. Mark, I'll let you settle this. What's the silver no, to no, gold? But I want to make another point about, about the silver. So, right now in the Shanghai exchange, the most actively traded contract, futures contract, is a silver contract. Okay. So, the idea that silver doesn't provide people with store of value properties is flawed because you have to go back to the natural properties. Because of the specific gravity of gold relative to silver and, this, and the crustal abundance of gold relative to silver, it's much easier for someone, the common man of the lower classes, to accumulate a weight of silver. It's and it's getting much, much easier. Yeah, it's much easier. So what does silver ultimately reflect? The savings of the common man. And what Why is not copper? It's, it's, it reflects the monetary future of copper. That's what copper was. No, copper no, used to no, make money. No, and now it's copper, copper is and the same is true of iron. No, but copper has no long-lasting store of value properties. It's consumed. Neither will silver. It's, it's, it's really just very few no, but people. That, but that's I'm talking naturally speaking. I, can have, I have a piece of silver here from 300 years ago. I'm staring at it. So the point I'm trying to say is if you're looking for an alternate explanation for why the gold-silver ratio is so out of whack, I can give you one. Why is it that a house in Ohio hasn't gone up as fast as a luxury apartment in New York? It's because we've been seeing one of the greatest transfers of wealth in the history of man. We live in, modernity is a serfdom. And so we have essentially a situation where the richest people are accumulating wealth at the fastest pace under this fiat money system and, and this liberal political system. So the result is that the savings asset for the rich has grown at a faster rate than the savings asset for the poor. Silver is literally known as the poor man's gold. But I don't see a problem with that. I don't see anything to infer from that. And I certainly don't see anything to infer that would allow me to say, well, now gold is next and Bitcoin, this thing that's been around for 10 years that we created, uh, is going to supplant it. Well, the thing that you should look at is the silver to gold ratio, the price of silver to gold. In 1870, it was about 15 ounces, 15 to 1. Today, it's 120. That massive, massive, massive decline in the price of silver compared to gold cannot be explained by fiat because it had started even before fiat. You know, between 1870 and 1914, silver had already been crashing and all of the countries that were on the silver standard had already moved from the silver standard onto a gold standard. So yeah, but if you have a fiat money system that's illusory and it's it's growing all industries because of silver's natural properties, you produce it as a byproduct of every metal. So as long as you have growth in the economy, you're producing a shitload of silver. It's very elastic. In fact, exactly. when, exactly. when the economy exactly. slows down... So it has a very low stock-to-flow ratio, and that's why it's being demonetized. And that's the same thing that... No, but, but, it, but if the economy slows down, if you have or the real economy slow down, then all of a sudden the supply of silver shrinks. Would you agree? No, because... Yeah. Because no, you're no, not, not producing all these other byproducts, copper and steel, and, and yeah. Oil. But if if it were to generate any significant monetary demand, if people were to actually start using it as money, even in the case of a financial no, crisis, they they have the utility and yeah. there's no limit on how much more you can increase the supply because it's much easier to find silver. But, but so yeah. I'm glad that you've come around to admit that it is about the supply side, the supply increase of silver, and that's no, it. I'm, that's I'm, I'm admitting it's about the natural property. So what I'm saying is, you you keep thinking that if the supply of silver shrinks, but wait, there's no monetary demand. But if we establish what I tried to argue in the initial part of the debate, that money arises from the utility of the good, the utility of silver never changes because it's part of that natural world of unchanging truths. 
So the if, utility uh, as a consumer good is different from its utility as money, and its utility as money is very lousy because its supply continues to be increased. But, but you, can't, you can't say that with any confidence because I can market, because the money, the supply of silver every year goes up by significant percentages every year, much yeah. higher than gold, and that's yeah. why gold has maintained its value relatively well in fiat inflation, but silver has not. Silver, you know, it's 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 been a one hundred and fifty year bear market for silver. Wait, in, how has it been a 150 year bear market if it was 65 cents 100 years ago? Because that's in fiat. Fiat has been going down even but further. Than you filter. can't say it's a bear market. So now you're comparing it against, but but I'm comparing it against fiat. It was 65 cents US but dollar. You now shouldn't compare it against fiat because fiat is toilet paper. It's worthless. It's meaningless. We're comparing it against gold, real money. No, that's no, but that, but you can't, but I'm trying to tell you, I'm giving you an alternate explanation that the people that are rich. That buy gold because they can buy a, a small amount Why of gold. People small buy smaller portions of uh, gold instead of buying big portions of silver. No, they can't. No, but you literally can't do that. So, so you can buy an ounce of silver for fifteen dollars. To try to get fifteen dollars of gold is impossible. Mark will tell yeah, you. Yeah, you can. You can buy it on Bitcoin and gold money on your server. I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about the world. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> so cool. let let things cool down. I think what what uh, regarding gold silver ratio, I also uh, follow this pretty closely. Uh, it is not true. I think that one can say it was in a hundred fifty year bear market, even priced in gold. Because if you take the nineteen seventies, gold silver ratio peaked uh, at the end of the nineteen seventies at uh, I think ten or so. So so silver went actually into a bull market, also priced in gold. Okay, you can you can yeah, take it down. Was, no was going pump and dump, like uh, hold on, hold on. It was like uh, hold, hold on, it was hold. a pump and dump. Somebody bought a lot of silver. It was the Hunt brothers back then. You know, well, like, well, okay. Bitcoin cash, but, but, but but there is also there, there is there is also a potential explanation. Um, uh, silver being very um, inflation sensitive, so. Uh, during a uh, rising environment of inflation, silver probably will rise faster than gold. And during a, a low inflation or deflationary period, silver will underperform. And that actually, I think, could also explain the current price of uh, silver relative to gold. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you already mentioned, Saif, we've, we've got a lot of deflationary pressures here as well. So that could be one possible explanation. But I, I, really, I really don't want to uh, go uh, too far off the topic. And, and I really, perhaps, if, if we could uh, progress to some of the more practical points um, when we compare gold and, and Bitcoin again, because this is actually the title of the debate, right? So um, I, I just would like to address a few criticism, as I uh, already mentioned, um, from, from the opposing side. So um, I, I often hear from, from the, the opposing side, for, from, from, from the Bitcoin side, that gold, the, verif the, the, the verification is a very difficult problem, the divisibility and the storage. So I would just like Roy to address those three, and then I've got three for, for Saif, if we could go for, for that. Please. So again, I, I reject the statement, and it's also, um, it, it just comes about from a misunderstanding of, of nature, and it's just a prepackaged argument that's basically nonsense. So the reason that we have the classic scientific method, like I said earlier, where we can observe, measure, repeat, predict, is because for some reason, it's an unexplained mystery, there are these elements that are the natural building blocks of everything. And at a certain moment, those elements become irreducible. What does that mean? That means each distinct element has unique attributes. Specific gravity, conductivity, electronegativity, malleability, ductility. All these words mean something that you can sense with your eyes, with your sense of touch, with your smell. Gold has no smell. It's chemically inert. Every other element has a smell. So when we measure how different elements smell, we use gold as the baseline because it has no smell. We compare it to everything else. The idea that you can counterfeit gold easily is nonsense. It came about from the media, the financial media, in those times where there was demand for gold. And the fact is that if anyone actually handled gold, here I have some gold right here, you can verify its authenticity by simply comparing it to anything else. We deal, we're one of the largest bullion bankers, we deal with billions of dollars in bullion, we've never once run into a tungsten bar. Now with tungsten, all you get is the ability to potentially trick the specific gravity. 
But all you have to do is check for its malleability or ductility or light it and see its melting point. So people have been that's much more complicated than just checking your Bitcoin node. It's it's an enormous world of difference. Yeah, it's a but much more advanced difference is I'm not fucking a service which consumes me and restricts my human action. I have something here at hand that I can verify that I can improve on my own a good, which then has utility and can become money. You're forcing me in a system that ultimately requires faith in something else. So I, I Nobody's just, forcing yeah. anybody. That's the point that you keep missing. If people march into Bitcoin and billions and trillions of dollars go into Bitcoin, it's going to be hard for you to continue to insist that this doesn't work. It's reality. Economic reality doesn't I, care I, about I your... I told you, I own, I own Bitcoin. It's just the reality. No, but we, we own Bitcoin. I have no problem speculating on technology like a Tesla stock. And I have no problem arguing, which is what my good friends in the Bitcoin world, the ones that are that I consider to be... Uh, uh, kind of the most successful ones, They their argument is first mover brand. That's what's going to make Bitcoin Bitcoin. And we can talk Those are the people who just got in early because they're lucky and they don't really get no, the no, I'm talking about people who got in a little, a little bit later. People have gotten a little bit later and, and, and are supporting the project in a very big way. So, Mark, counterfeiting gold is not easy. In fact, I hope Saifdeen will agree with me on this. What generally you see is you don't counterfeit the gold. You either clip the weight of the gold, uh, you know, basically through through fraud, or you try to introduce an inferior element, an inferior good, and tell people, "Hey, use this instead of gold." And by doing that, you accumulate the gold. So it's Gresham's law. Storage. If you're going to make some kind of an abstract argument where you're uh, comparing uh, something not real with something real then yeah, I can store all of my uh, uh, dreams in my brain. Um, but if you're looking at elements, again, the irreducible building blocks, you can't store anything else that has the same specific gravity and crustal abundance in the lowest amount of space as you can with gold. That's why when you go into my vaults, I can store a billion dollars of gold within a small area and if I want to store a billion dollars of silver, I need warehouses upon warehouses upon warehouses because the the uh, 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 density, the value density, and here I'm using the fiat value term, which I hate, but the, fi the fiat value density of silver is much, much, much lower than it is for gold. So the storage of gold is the best thing you can store physically. Sure, can you store things that are abstract better than something physical? Yes, but I reject that argument. Okay. How much of agreement do we have, Saif, on this one? Any? <laughs> no, not really. Okay. I, I think the, the, no. the obsession with the physicality is just uh, becoming more and more quaint with every day that Bitcoin continues to operate. And, you know, I, I, I urge you to recant before your children and grandchildren start laughing at you, Roy. Um, <laughs> we, we don't want you on, on, on the opposite end. We don't want you getting laughed at. The things people. that are necessary for you every day are real things. Real good. They are necessary and they are real, but for them, not, but it's not necessary for the monetary function. The monetary function can be but very well played. But that's because as long, long as we can ensure it's supposed to be. But yeah, so so if you can show me the things that matter to people are the basic goods. The average person just wants to live a life and provide for their family, and they want to eat, and they want to have clothing and shelter, and those are the things. That's the real economy that's based on the elements that never changes. So in that way, I can't compare something from that world. Just like if I don't eat, I die. Or if I jump in front of a you know, car, something happens to me. I can't compare that to the possibilities of my mind or some service that's being offered to me. I don't know that a service is scarcity once it becomes commoditized. Uh, retains its scarcity because what I've seen throughout history with services. No, you've just called it a service, and you've just assumed that you know math doesn't work, and therefore you're not sure about the. But again, that's an entrepreneurial decision. And again, you know, I tell you, ultimately, it's it's really human action and human choice that's going to decide this. It's people deciding what they want to do and what they want to uh, put their money in, and. It's 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 not as long as Bitcoin can continue to be sent across borders when gold can't. I think that's just well, going why to can't you send, but, but what can you send better across borders that's physical, like the things you need? So right now, during than gold, 
I can send a billion dollars in Bitcoin across no, borders you, in like you, 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 say, 10 transactions that'll take a couple of hours and it's done and it costs 50 cents or 5 cents in, yeah. in transaction fees. Yeah. With, Bitcoin, with gold, if I want, you know, when, when the US and the, really, I think this is the final, my, my punchline really, when, when Germany tried to repatriate its gold from the US, it took many years and many millions of dollars to ship that gold and insure and, and carry it out. And it's just... The, the the cost of performing final settlement with gold with physical gold is massively expensive and without that you're relying on the credit of the people who run the banking system and that's how you end up with fiat and that's how bitcoin solved this problem by just making it so incredibly cheap to make final settlement across international borders and that's really you know the the, the checkmate for gold but gold cannot really do that so again, if you have a service with an abstract unit measured of its in itself, you can send it anywhere. But that that is not comparable to a physical good. I can send a billion dollars of gold from London to New York for fifty dollars, five hundred dollars. I mean, the example you use of Germany. So that's just like using the example of Bitfinex uh, having some of their money uh, frozen by a bank somewhere. It, it's not. If we're trying to debate the fundamental first principles. Uh, you can't say that Bitcoin is better than gold at transferring value. You, you can say they're two different things. In the real world, gold is the best thing. That's why it's continually used for that purpose. And in the virtual world, you can focus on trying to make the argument why Bitcoin would be better than any version of Bitcoin, any version of Libra or stablecoin. And that's the realm where you, where you can make that argument. And I'd be happy to support that argument. But you can't compare it to gold. That's not strong enough argument uh, to say that that Bitcoin is going to supplant gold because under that basis, you'd have to show me how Bitcoin can feed me, clothe me, shelter me, provide me with energy, uh, or be a commodity good that I can... Improve. Same way gold does those things. You don't live in gold and you don't eat gold and you don't wear it. You exchange it for those things and but, you can also exchange it. part Bitcoin. of the natural world. This is the basis of the Aristotelian metaphysic that Menger based his own theory on. So this is the basis of pre-digital monetary economics. It's uh, you know the you're, you're, you're talking about why the post office will never be able to uh, will you know email will never be able to replace letters. No, it can perform the function of a letter. I can send you information with email, and so it's going to be done. And yes, people will still use uh, post for sending stuff, but for sending information, it's becoming far, far, far more useful to just sure. use. And what do we see in that? That's what money is. Money is information. And what do we see with that commodification of a service? The, the original uniqueness and scarcity of a letter has become diluted so that all, all the incidental features of a letter have become polished away. With a physical letter, you get an entirely different experience than with an email. And so what we end up seeing is services end up consuming their users because they're just trying to distribute a, a service at the highest possible margin over time and, and try to give everyone the same experience, but they fundamentally can't because it's a closed system.